All right, so now we're on to Nietzsche. So I've already done uh, the genealogy of morality on here. So if you haven't listened to that one, you know, go read the book slash listen to my attempt to, to understand it. Uh, but today, The Birth of Tragedy. So this was Nietzsche's first book, I guess technically, uh, and it was written in uh, around 1870, 1871. And the version that I have is the one with the added preface, uh, written by Nietzsche, where it uh, was written about 16 years later, where he kind of responds to himself and what he was doing in this book. So to just kind of quickly go through that, he says he wasn't overly satisfied with his attempt for a few reasons. And the two big things that he gets at himself for uh, are using two kind of two modern references or his references being too modern. Uh, notably, throughout the course of the book, he makes extended use of Schopenhauer uh, and some Kant that he finds later on in 1886, he thought to be a little bit um, kind of out of place. He should have been more focused on, you know, the topic at hand, and that is Greek tragedy and the place that it, you know, uh, the place it sat in terms of the entire, you know, idea of Western art, Western um, ideas of beauty and all that. So then the other thing was that he found that he had too much hope, like he had too much of an optimistic idea or ideal as to what, you know, tragedy meant for humankind. And, you know, without much further ado, uh, I guess we can just jump right into it. So this begins actually uh, with the part titled Forward to Wagner, or I think in some other versions it's called Preface to Wagner, Wagner, I should say. So he tells us right off the bat here, and this is really sets the stage for the whole thing and is something that comes through throughout the course of the entire book, which, if you haven't read, is kind of repetitive. This book is... It's repetitive. <laughs> you know, I can't put it in other terms. It's repetitive, uh, but we're going to get into it. So he says right off the bat that art is essentially the consequence of a struggle between Apollo and Dionysus. So these are two gods uh, belonging to Greek mythology, each of which had their respective positions, where Apollo was the god of healing, medicine, uh, and music, and poetry, and Dionysus was the god of wine and fertility. So he opposes these two gods, suggesting that they kind of operate in a kind of tense harmony. And it is through this kind of tense harmony that they develop something called art. But Nietzsche takes it further to suggest that beyond the, um, the kind of uh, domains that they were responsible for, that is for Apollo music and poetry and for Dionysus uh, fertility and um, I guess drunkenness, he suggests that Apollo is the art of the image maker or sculptor, and Dionysus, the image imageless art of music. So here he opposes the art of painting, sculpting, essentially the art of images to the art of music. So now we have a further demarcation or a further bifurcation or another bifurcation where we have Apollo and Dionysus, but now we also have image and music respectively, relocates along Apollo, the image, and along Dionysus, music. So they're, um, I guess they're coming together, I guess in a synergetic kind of way, forms what is called Attic Tragedy. So Attic tra Tragedy was essentially uh, a certain s Attic referred to a state of ancient Greece of which Athens was the capital. So it's just, you know, Greece as I think most people would understand it if we aren't thinking about Sparta or anything like that. So then from here, he takes the time to go into each one of these domains, that is Dionysus and, uh, and uh, uh, Apollo. Uh, through the, He goes into each of them specifically to kind of unravel what makes each of them tick. So he begins with Apollo. So Apollo was associated, according to Nietzsche, with dreams, which could be either positive or negative. So that, that was kind of ambiguous. You know, how can they be either positive or negative? And through what standard are we... Uh, I guess, testing this positivity or this negativity. Well, Nietzsche says that in the dream, there's a kind of possibility present there, a kind of possibility to break down, you know, the boundaries associated with reality, quote unquote, or empirical 
you know, worldness, where he says that the dream gives us, you know, a way out almost. But the dream is also a domain that is purely Im- uh, uh, comprised of images. So it is in that way that it is grounding, because it grounds us through the reconstruction of images, but it is liberating in that it takes us out of a kind of reality situation. So he says then that the dream state is a kind of transcendent state versus daylight world. And that's on 16 for who anyone's curious. Uh, so the image of Apollo always resists the becoming real of the image. It kind of keeps the image in a state of perpetual imageness, where we know when we're looking at a sculpture that we're not looking at a you know, a real person. The sculpture is once removed from reality. Now, Nietzsche opposes this, Apollo, or Apolline idea, to the Dionysian idea, and that is the idea of music, or the art of music, where he says that these two ideas, Dionysus and music, are associated not with the image world per se, but with intoxication. So it disappears subjectivity, which is kind of an odd way to put it, but it essentially makes the person uh, cease being an individual. Or sorry, I should commit the blasphemous thing right now of correcting myself, which I shouldn't have made the mistake in the first place. But when going talking about Apollo there, there's an added term, there's a term I wish to add, and that is that the whole Apolline, Apollonian, whatever, uh, trend points to what Nietzsche calls the Principum individuationis, that is the individual principle, or the principle of individuation. That is the idea that each one of us is, you know, an individual separate from others, essentially. So Dionysus, to go back now to Dionysus, opposes that. They dis- it disappears subjectivity, or it disappears the Principum individuationis. So in that way, Nietzsche suggests that it kind of renews the bond between humans and rejuvenates nature. So singing, dancing, turns man into God, a kind of work of art in and of itself. So as he will come to say, and we're going to elaborate on this a little more, the Dionysian track kind of leads humans to a basic fundamental ontology of being. That is a being of connectivity, a being in association with nature, with the, you know, animal, with, you know, all that type of thing. And this is where we, I, I think it's safe to say, you know, Deleuze and Guattari get their idea of becoming. Becoming world or becoming animal or becoming God or becoming satyr, as he comes to say here, uh, is one of the things that goes on in this Dionysian trend because it takes you out of your individual position, your kind of privileged subject position and casts you into the unknown. So as he is... Upon establishing these two opposing tendencies, that is the Apollo or the Dionysian one, uh, he says that artists can belong to either. So you could have the Apollonian artist or the uh, Dionysian artist. But he says that Greek tragedy, which is the topic of the book, essentially uses both. It takes from both, and that is what makes it so interesting for Nietzsche. And it is from here then he, he segues into his discussion about Greek tragedy, which kind of set is what the you know what he gets stays on for the rest of the book pretty much. So as Nietzsche identifies, there was uh, between from Rome to Babylon, he says that there were essentially Dionysian festivals, like these things existed in the world, and they can be traced, and you know there are records of them and all that. Uh, now this is where, and I quote, uh, the wildest of nature's beasts were unleashed. So Greeks were, in response to this, or in in relation to this, for a time protected from this by their proclivity for the Apollonian. So the Greeks, in response to, you know, all the different Dionysian festivals going on between Rome and Babylon, they kind of saw themselves as being almost too good for it, right? So they're like, oh, we have our, you know, Apollonian trend of the image form, and we're going to be totally fine with that. Like, we don't have to deal with music. That's just... It's just a waste of time. But the allure of the Dionysian festival essentially gave way in Greece, and the Greek themselves took it on to some extent. However, their association with it was different. It wasn't an unleashing, per se, of a kind of wild beast. It was instead uh, what Nietzsche calls a transfiguration. 
So what he says, um, that is essential, uh, an essential destabilization of the principum individuationis, the becoming different, not of unleashing something that is always there per se, but of something uh, transforming into something wholly other. So it is no surprise then that this was met with a lot of strange feelings. You know, you would have reactionary uh, feelings that wanted to oppose it. You had feelings of acceptance that didn't really know how to understand it. But for Nietzsche, essentially, the entire timbre was of uh, terror and a horror. Or in his words, it elicited terror and horror from Homeric Greek world. So Homeric Greek world being uh, the Greek world in, at, during the time of Homer, you know, who wrote the Iliad. So one of the ways that the Greeks practiced this kind of Dionysian celebration was through the dithyram. And I hope I'm pronouncing that right, dithyramb, which was essentially a wild choral hymn. Uh, so this, for Nietzsche, was a mix of kind of singing and dancing that would bring about, in quote, oneness among the people, which is, you know, again, breaking down that principum individuationis. And what that created, or what it was almost, more than just a space for people to give themselves over, was it was also a space of recognition, where it took, at least this is kind of what Nietzsche suggests, it took a certain kind of person to be able to recognize what that celebration signified. Therefore, it would only kind of attract people with a common interest in it. So there was a community forming around it, and that community was one that essentially was part of the um, uh, anti-individual movement, essentially, in favor of it becoming oneness, becoming community, becoming uh, kind of one with the world. So then he asks, why? Why did the Greeks have this proclivity, or were, why were they so willing to accommodate this trend? And why did they take it up in such a strange way in comparison to Rome and Babylon? So he says that we got we to gotta even take a step further back. He says we have to look at the kind of genealogy of uh, Greek mythology. So he asks, why is it that there was essentially a company of gods, I guess a plethora of gods, around which, uh, around whom they orbited um, Apollo? I don't know if that sentence makes sense. All the gods kind of originate from Apollo. That is what I'm saying. And Nietzsche finds this really interesting. And what is more, Nietzsche finds it totally wild that these the Greeks essentially had such a, a love for their gods. So he says, and this is on 22, anyone who approaches the Olympians with another religion in his heart and proceeds to look for signs of moral loftiness in them, or indeed holiness, or incorporation, corporal spirituality or a loving gaze filled with compassion will soon be found to turn forced to turn him his back on them in dismay and disappointment nothing here reminds us of asceticism of spirituality and duty everything here speaks only of overbrimming indeed triumphant existence where everything that exists has been deified regardless of whether it is good or evil thus the spectator may stand in some perplexity before this fantastic superabundance of life asking himself what magic potion these people can have drunk which makes them see Helen, hovering in sweet sensuality, smiling at them whenever they look, the ideal image of their own existence. So, this just feeds into the mystery. For Nietzsche, he's like, he's asking, why were the Greeks so much into these, these gods? And why did they, it, it seem as though they were intoxicated because of these gods? Well, he goes back to another point. Another point dealing with the story uh, of Silenus, or the wise Silenus, who essentially um, was a companion of Dionysus, and who revealed to the Greeks that life essentially sucks. So Silenus was a, essentially a daemon that was being sought by a certain king, uh, because the king wanted Silenus to tell him, you know, the meaning of life and what everything meant, um, where he said he responded after, upon being caught, Wretched ephemeral race, children of chance and tribulation, why do you force me to tell you the very thing which it would be most profitable for you not to hear? The very best thing is utterly beyond your reach, not to have been born, not to be, to be nothing. However, the second best thing for you is to die soon. So, obviously, bad news to get for humankind. And Nietzsche says, okay, okay. 
two options were essentially open to the Greeks at that point. Either they could heed the Selenius' plea, essentially for humans to just die off, or give yourself over in total intoxication to the wonders of the world, to which the Greeks essentially chose the, the, the latter, or at least the Dionysian track of it. So, in his words, in order to be able to live, the Greeks were obliged by the most profound compulsion to create this gods, which was a way for them to kind of have a develop a meaning in a world that had left them behind, in a world that had essentially given them nothing. But it is not only the gods to which the Greeks gave birth. As Nietzsche says, the same drive which calls art into being to complete and perfect existence and thus to seduce us into continuing to live also gave rise to the world of the Olympians in which the Hellenic will held up a transforming mirror to itself. Thus gods justify the life of men by living it themselves, the only sac satisfactory theodicy. But the type of art that they create is not necessarily um, one of, as I might have, you know, it might have seemed I was saying earlier, uh, one of total intoxication or total Dionysian uh, inclinations. Instead, it could be a very reactionary art, uh, an art that seeks to add um, logic to, see, seeks to kind of instill order into the world, which Nietzsche calls the naive art, where he says that whenever we counter the naive in art, we have to recognize that it is the supreme effect of a Paul Apolline culture. As such, it has to overthrow the realm of the titans and slay monsters, and by employing powerful delusions and intensely pleasurable illusions, gain victory over a terrifyingly profound view of the world and the most acute sensitivity to suffering. So it is, in that way, a reaction to those terrible words ushered by uh, Salinas, that is, you know, that there's no meaning and that humans are bound to suffer. Humans then create this art in order to ostensibly take them out of that, to ostensibly give them meaning beyond suffering. And as, you know, a proper Nietzschean would say, what is wrong with suffering? What is wrong with pain? Is it because do the Greeks or did the Greeks have such a propensity for beauty because they were scared of suffering or was it because they embraced suffering? It's kind of the, a guiding question here. So in these two opposing tendencies, that is a naive art that is ready to, you know, renounce suffering and an art that is ready to take it on, make it, put it center stage. Nietzsche gives us two different figures where he gives us Homer as being the uh, horary dreamer. And remember what Nietzsche thought about dreams in relation to Apollo and Archilochus. I'm definitely mispronounced that. I'm not like a... I'm not a Greek or classical scholar, so I, I've never really heard these names <laughs> and, and, out loud. But Archilochus, Archilochus, who Nietzsche says is the man driven wide, wildly through existence. A very Dionysian idea. So with these two figures, Nietzsche then ascribes another one of the bifurcations that we were presented with earlier. That is the distinction between the communal and the uh, individual or the subjective to which we could also uh, apply the same distinction between the subjective and maybe the objective, as uh, he says here. So this distinction essentially reveals that the subjective belongs to Archilochus, and the objective um, belongs to Homer. That is the objective of images, the objective of world as kind of truth or, or uh, reality, and Archilochus being subjective, a kind of individual going into the unknown. This presents a problem, though, for Nietzsche because he sees the point of art as being wanting to get rid of the subjective. So essentially the question arises, how can we put, you know, associate the Dionysian with this Archilochus guy if he's essentially the arbiter of a kind of subjectivity? You know, the subjectivity that says, I need to undo my objectivity. I need to undo my um, kind of selfness. So how then can we look up to Archilochus? So the answer he gives us is on page 30, where he says that the artist in this case has already given up his subjectivity in the Dionysian process. The image which now shows him his unity with the heart of the world is a dream scene, which gives sensuous expression to the primal contradiction and pain, along with its primal lust 
for, and pleasure in semblance. Thus the eye of the lyric poet, the Archilochus in this case, sounds out from the deepest abyss of being, his, in quotes, subjectivity, as this concept is used by modern aestheticians, is imaginary. So there's a distinction to be made then, and it's not one that Nietzsche fully works out here. But in this domain of subjectivity, one at first glance he appears to renounce uh, demands on further examination to be itself bifurcated between what he suggests here is the imaginary subjectivity and what he opposes to it, the kind of Apollonian subjectivity, the subjectivity of the principum individuationist. But that's an essay for someone else to write. There, There's an idea. Maybe just give me credit. Now what it comes down to for the Dionysian self, the Dionysian subject, is a giving oneself over to what he calls the primordial unity, so with its pain and contradiction. So in this moment, he produces a copy of this primordial primordial unity as music, which has been described elsewhere, quite rightly, as a repetition of the world and a second copy of it. Now, however, under the influence of the Appalene dream, this music in turn becomes visible to him as a symbol, as in a symbolic dream image. So the Apollonian idea can only go so far. It'll hit a barrier in a kind of um, ephemeral dream-like state where he says that both the sculptor and his relative, the epic poet, are lost in the pure contemplation of images. The Dionysian musician, with no image at all, is nothing but primal pain and the primal echo of it. The lyric genius feels a world of images and symbols growing out of his mystical state of self-abandonment and oneness, a world which has a quite different coloring, causality and tempo from that of the sculptor and the epic poet, whereas the latter is joyfully contented living in these images and in them alone and never tires of contemplating lovingly even the minutest details of them and whereas even the image of the wrathful Achilles is for him near, merely an image of those wrathful expressions he enjoys with the dream pleasure and semblance. So, a lot there, sorry. So the sculptor and the artist is, are essentially caught, as he says here, in the realm of images, whereas the Dionysiac, the Dionysian has no image at all. He is not bound by it. And, Nietzsche reiterates, the eye that is associated of the lyric poet is not the same eye of what he calls um, an empiric, or waking, empirically real human being, but rather the only eyeness which truly exists at all, eternal and resting in the ground of things. And through the images which are copies of the eye, the lyric genius can say, see down to that very ground of all things. So that brings Nietzsche then to Schopenhauer, who has his own thoughts on this matter. So for Nietzsche, quoting Schopenhauer, he finds that Schopenhauer believes in this kind of lyric poet, kind of archilochus, simultaneously having an I or a self or a subjectivity and not having it. Uh, he finds the answer in Schopenhauer to go as follows. So for Schopenhauer, there's essentially, uh, talking about music or the song, it is essentially... Uh, where did I lose it here? It is essentially the meeting sum of what he calls the burdensome will and the pure willless knowing. So as I think Nietzsche has been slowly getting at here, there's a kind of I and a non-I or an anti-I. There is also in Schopenhauer the idea of a will and a willlessness. But Nietzsche takes this time then to say, I don't know about that. It's, that seems a little bit far-fetched to me. And the reason is as follows. Essentially that for Nietzsche, he doesn't buy this because he sees no place for a will in art. He sees no place for a kind of um, subjectivity in art. So that's a pretty contentious thing for me to say, uh, but I'm going to justify it reading his words. So we maintain the contrary, that is, the contrary to Schopenhauer, that the entire opposition between the subject, subjective and the objective, uh, which Schopenhauer two still uses to divide up the arts, so like Nietzsche, Schopenhauer does it as well, as if it were some criterion of value, is absolutely inappropriate in aesthetics since the subject, the willing individual in pursuit of his own egotistical goals, can only be considered the opponent of art and not its origin. And that's on 32 in my version. <laughs> 
So there is a risk in all this that Nietzsche recognizes, and that is that we may never actually understand art because the process of understanding demands a certain degree of selfness, subjectivity, to recognize a, you know, something. Uh, and if we can't have that, then it'd be very difficult for us to ever claim to know what art is, because art is that which renounces the subject. So he kind of gives us that little, you know, depressing note, but do with it what you will. But to go from this depressing statement to back to Archilochus, uh, Nietzsche says that he, he gave us the idea of folk music, or gave us folk music, which Nietzsche held was the meeting of the Apollonian and the Dionysian or the being a mix of the two, but not a, not a synthesis. They are still both there as themselves. They, they resist that Aufhebung type, type, you know, dialectical thing, and instead exist as separate things, but that are kind of working together in harmony. And this is what, for Nietzsche, essentially made it popular and made it persevere through time and space. So folk music, for Nietzsche, is above all else, uh, essentially a musical mirror of the world at least in his words. So melody is the primary and general element of the world. So this gives birth to poetry, because melody, you know, poetry is that which is, um, I guess, all melody over, a, if you're using a kind of steady drum beat, you know, over the, uh, or riding underneath poetry, the poetry serves, uh, takes up the place of the melody. Or in Nietzsche's words, he considered the melody between, to be, the uneven, irregular image world of the lyric, kind of uh, deterritorialized the lyric, which he says was essentially, despite its popularity, was condemned by, you know, the higher-ups, the aristocrats, (laughs) because it was fundamentally dangerous, because in folk and tragedy, for that matter, or sorry, in poetry and folk music, what you essentially saw was a becoming musical of language which wouldn't then lend itself to a kind of reason or rationality that was sought after, which we'll get into more as we go on here. Uh, The key figure of that being Socrates, but again, we'll get into that. But without digressing, uh, Nietzsche says that then there are two different ways the Greeks gave us a kind of understanding of language. There is either language as music, which has its relationship to the folk song, to poetry, to the Dionysian, or there is language from the world of appearance, belonging to the Apollonian, painting, sculpture, that kind of thing. And it's kind of funny. He raises, um, uh, he thinks about a, maybe like a possible aside where someone might say, well, what about when language is used to describe music, to evoke an image? Like, um, and the example he gives is like, if a certain kind of music is pastoral, then, uh, you know, it evokes an image, which is associated with that music. To which Nietzsche says that that isn't, uh, that image does not then become Dionysian. That image is always already within the Apollonian trend. And it's just an Apollonian way to try to understand music because it grounds it. It makes it essentially an image that is not malleable in the way that melody is. So how to understand this? Nietzsche gives us Schopenhauer once more to suggest that this melody, this kind of freeing of um, language through music represents a kind of will, so a will to go beyond, to go into the unknown, where Nietzsche says we can't understand it in those terms because that implies too much of a subjective being behind the act. And fundamentally, going away from Schopenhauer here uh, again, uh, language can't penetrate music because music speaks to our fundamental, you know, ontology as a primal unity, while Language is essentially, at least language as it belongs to the realm of appearances of Apollo, uh, only works at the level of, I guess, simulation. Simulation of appearance, of phenomena. So then from this, from uh, folk music, from poetry, from the becoming melody of language and all that, we essentially see the emergence of Greek tragedy which for him he specifies as actually coming out of what he calls the Greek chorus. So the Greek chorus was uh, was essentially the moment when there was a response, and this is like in a play, the response to the plot by other actors. So they kind of assumed, and we're going to trouble this in a moment, but the person uh, responding to the plot uh, 
or actors responding to the plot kind of assumed the place of the spectator. So they were saying what the spectator couldn't. But we, again, kind of sidebar that for now because we're going to trouble it a little bit or soon, sooner than later, um, where he says that it would be wrong to consider it like that because to consider it like that would almost be like um, it would present then a kind of democratic space where there's no real kind of distinction between stage and spectator, where the spectator has as much of a place on the stage as the actors. Nietzsche doesn't like that. Nietzsche doesn't want us to think about the chorus in those terms for that reason. But then he provides another way that we shouldn't look at it. And he says that we shouldn't take the chorus, again, that person or people responding to the plot, as being the idea of the ideal spectator. So the ideal spectator being the kind of voice of the people or of the ideal person on the stage. And he doesn't like that because then, you know, it opens up a lot of questions like, well, you know, whose voice, who's the ideal spectator, yada, yada, yada. Who is this single person, this Uberman or Uvalmanch or whatever the fuck standing out there. And the reason that he wants to avoid these two ways of looking at it is because that would almost make it, and this is vague, like I, I'll admit, this is vague, uh, he says that that would almost make the stage and the art and the tragedy too true. It would almost make it not a work of art because then it'd be a, a participatory thing that just belongs to the realm of appearances, re belongs to the realm of reality, essentially, to which Nietzsche wants to maintain that position of the tragedy within the domain of art as a Dionysian kind of space of potential. So then he comes to say that Tragedy was essentially a weapon against all naturalism in art. And that's from 38 to 39. So the tragedy for him to, and he continues on this more, uh, begins, I guess, with the satyr. So the satyr is kind of like the half horse, bottom half like a goat, and top half like a devilish looking creature uh, who essentially speaks the Dionysiac, Dionysiac wisdom of tragedy. And the figure of this person that is half animal, half human, really speaks to a non-Apollonian idea because, you know, it implies an ambiguity of the subject. Is the subject human? Is the subject animal? Indeterminacy lies at the core of that being. So there are a bunch of different consequences that come about because of the tragedy. And these are some that we've already kind of hinted at, or didn't hint at, but said outright. And that is that it uh, essentially submerges it it dissipates all personal experiences um and brings people back to quote unquote the heart of nature so it gives people knowledge essentially but this knowledge is not um bound up with a kind of desire to act in fact it disturbs action it makes it so that people are uh not ready to give themselves over as subjects but are ready to kind of disappear into a, an endless process of kind of becoming a kind of, you know, becoming rhizomatic non-ness. And which uh, the satire then essentially destabilized what Nietzsche called culture man or cultured man, which belongs to the realm of reality. And another way of thinking about it is not necessarily through tragedy or through um, music, but again, through, through poetry is one of those things we've already discussed. Uh, being that way by which the satire is able to disturb the cultured man. So then we get, you know, another distinction. So whereas we had the Apollonian Dionysian and then appearance and, uh, I guess, like intoxication or dream and intoxication, we now have poetry versus reality or the thing in itself versus phenomenon. So I haven't read my much of Kant yet, uh, not enough to speak about it confidently, but what I do understand, you know, is this distinction between thing in itself, or the word that it assumes is uh, noumenon, or noumenal, versus phenomenon, or appearance. So Nietzsche privileges the thing in itself here, suggesting that that thing in itself always points back to this primal unity as being the kind of pure original ontological condition, whereas the phenomenon is susceptible to culture and human intervention and will and illusion, things he kind of wants to get out of. But let it be clear, 
it's not as though he's opposing what is perceived to be truth, that is the appearance, with what he believes to be another truth, that is the underneath all the uh, all the illusion, all the appearance lies a kind of realness. Rather, what we'll find beneath all the truth is an ambiguity like no other, and that is precisely want, what he wants to get at, what he sees being a place of possibility, because that ambiguity holds such potential that it can't be characterized, it can't be consolidated under an image. So the spectator then, when you know watching the Dionysiac show, they do in a sense become a kind of ideal spectator because they become what Nietzsche calls an, a Dionysiac mass. They disappear into their becoming ambiguity, and that ambiguity then assumes its own like position because it corresponds to that primal unity that then assumes a kind of ideal spectator because they are totally given over to that non-ness. That non-ness becomes, uh, is endowed kind of in the last instance with an identity in and of itself. So in relation to others, there is an understanding of each one's mutual position in that situation. And there was a kind of respect that emerges from that. And it is from there that we see the emergence, according to Nietzsche, of drama, which is essentially the acting out of another by oneself. So the ability to undo yourself as being, as an individual, to give yourself over to another that is among you, among the ranks, in the same kind of Dionysiac uh, trend, which essentially marks for Nietzsche individuality being surrendered on 43. But again, we haven't lost Apollo, or not again, we haven't lost Apollo in all of this. In fact, Apollo has kind of always been on the scene here, even through this emergence of this tragic Dionysian form, where he says that the Greek tragedy is essentially Dionysian chorus in Apolline world of images. And that is why the tragedy is essentially the mix of both, because the dramatic form on the stage is a world of images, right? Essentially, it's, an, it's a world of scenes. So it's in that way that Apollo still exists there, but that is precisely what gives, its, gives it its potential, at least tragedy's potential, because it points to the limit of both. It points to the limit of the Dionysian, and it points to the limit of the Apollonian, not privileging one or the other, but showing how they exist in this harmony, not synthesis, but harmony, that, and they wrestle a little bit, where one's always trying to take over, but that is exactly where the synergy comes from. That is exactly where the potential comes from. But this only gets further exacerbated when the even Dionysus appears on stage at times, and that you might assume different forms, and we'll get into them a little bit later on, like Oedipus, for instance, is a Dionysian figure, but that's a big kind of rendering image of Dionysus. So for, uh, uh, for, so for a time, Dionysus only only existed on the stage as an imaginary figure, but at one time it was kind of given a face. So this essentially, what it, what it came down to then was the job of the satyr to convince the people that Dionysus wasn't actually on stage as Dionysus, nor was Dionysus on stage as like, um, you know, of its own volition, but rather that Dionysus came on stage because of the collective quote-unquote ecstasy of the spectators giving themselves over to the idea of Dionysus and it was only at that moment that Dionysus would appear so then tragedy for you know continue on this for Nietzsche is a mix of Dionysian lyric of the chorus and Apollonian or Apolline dream world so then he uh, Nietzsche goes on to discuss Sophocles and another name I'm going to screw up Asicles Asicles I think uh, as two figures that, you know, as two um, playwrights that really work this out, that really present what Nietzsche believes to be the tragic form very uh, faithfully on stage. So the figure of Oedipus is the one he figures on or contemplates for the most part. So Oedipus essentially reveals nature's nature for, uh, for Nietzsche where he performs the unnatural, like Dionysus, to reveal nature's secrets. So Oedipus wanting to go against the incest taboo, or to perform incest, which goes against nature, 
essentially reveals for Nietzsche the nature of nature or the truth of nature. So to quote Nietzsche here, and this is on 46, 46, sorry, no, 48, wrote my numbers wrong. Uh, he asked, how else could nature be forced to reveal its secrets other than by victorious resistance to her, i.e. by some unnatural event? I see this insight expressed in that terrible trinity of Oedipus's fate, the same man who solves the riddle of nature, that of the double-natured sphinx, must also destroy the most sacred orders of nature by murdering his father and becoming his mother's husband. Wisdom, the myth seems to whisper to us, and Dionysiac wisdom in particular, is an unnatural abomination. So it is through that disturbing nature that a, a new possibility emerges, the Dionysian possibility. So then he equates this, or Nietzsche then uh, relates this to the Asicles Promethean story, story of Prometheus. I really hope Asicles, Asicles, yeah, whatever, um, where uh, Pr uh, Pr Prometheus steals fire from the gods. Now, Nietzsche considers this to be a Prome an un-Apollonian story, that is a Dionysian one, because it disturbs Apollo's desire to keep order. And it makes it so that the gods essentially lose that grip of order. Um, and they're, then, you know, without elaborating on this too much, he Nietzsche riffs more on that, exposing the similarities between uh, Asicles' story and Sophocles. And the, But the one thing that we'll continue on through here is that uh, what is similar, but sorry, my, my brain's uh, not working as well as I wish it was right now. But what is similar between the two for Nietzsche, and this is what I find personally to be the most important, is that in both cases, the Dionysian figure, that is Oedipus in one and Prometheus in the other, suffer. They suffer greatly for their um, kind of insurgent or uh, usurpation of power, of order. But it is even this suffering where in the case of, um, I guess, Oedipus... Uh, where or both where they they are tortured essentially uh, and it is being this kind of torn to pieces that Nietzsche says they become air water earth and fire as his suffering to get back to nature so it is through the suffering that they actually go further into the Dionysian tract they kind of go back to nature through that and that is symbolized by their being tortured so suffering that is not to go back to that idea suffering that is not something to be feared or revered, or, or revered. Sorry, yeah, it, it is something to be revered, um, because it is something that brings us back to nature, essentially. Uh, so, art and tragedy, things that can induce a sense of suffering or sadness, kind of deep emotional uh, bodily reaction, brings us to this Dionysian place, or what has also been called the primal unity, or. Another thing that does that for us is myth for Nietzsche, which he says religion essentially screws up. Religion destroys myth. But, yeah. But tragedy revitalizes myth. It essentially gives us, you know, stories again, not truth, you know, religious truths per se. So what happened to tragedy then? Where did it go? Well, Nietzsche says that it didn't have the luxury of other forms of art that kind of died through old age. It died for Nietzsche by suicide. However, it wasn't. It didn't completely go away. What was left was a kind of vast emptiness, and that imagery is interesting. I think because you know, an emptiness in itself could be a you know a site for possibility. Uh, but there was one figure and a few others that came along to try and revive it, essentially, and that figure was Euripides. So Euripides was um, another playwright who uh, was famous for. You know, a number of different plays that took up tragic themes and some comedic ones. So for Nietzsche, whereas the pre-Euripides pre -Euri tragedy wanted to, in his words, put, put on stage the faithful mask of reality, Euripides wanted to blur the line between the stage and the spectator. So essentially with Euripides, the spectators saw their double on stage, uh, a kind of democratic move, as Nietzsche identifies it. So this was kind of the birth of the well-educated mass, where the it was seen that the spectator could be, you know, an active participant on the stage, a blurring of the line between what existed there and what existed in quote-unquote real life. 
kind of foreclosing of possibilities, kind of giving it over to the jackals of, you know, truth or reality. But even to a kind of like liberal mind, um, uh, kind of uh, frame of mind, this shouldn't be something celebrated as a kind of democratic move, uh, because Nietzsche believes that that it was actually, even before that, you know, the spectators greatly appreciated the tragedies and the kind of art they would see on stage, uh, and it was with Euripides that there was a kind of loss of lack of respect for the audience. It was like at one point, then it with Euripides, the audience became something that kind of pandered to as though they were children. As though they weren't in themselves, like, um, I guess, adult, you know, thinking, breathing beings. And in that, you know, Euripides lost, essentially didn't show any respect for his audience. And the audience didn't show respect for the art. Hence the, you know, disappearance of tragedy. So why was this? Why was Euripides this person that essentially fucked up tragedy? Well, Nietzsche says that there were two people that were kind of kept him at bay and kept him from making tragedy or keeping tragedy as it once was. And those two people are, and it's funny, Nietzsche kind of keeps us in suspense. He gives us the first one and then he's like, before we get into the next one, before I tell you who this other one is, let me talk about this first one for a while. I won't do that. So the first one is himself, kind of panoptic self, you know, uh, control. And then there was Socrates, so here we're getting to Socrates. So Europe, uh, to speak first about himself. So what himself did to control himself to not, you know, allow tragedy to enter this good, you know, possible space. Uh, it was him as thinker that stopped that. Him as thinker was the person that tried to, you know, logically subscribe, prescribe to his art, you know, um, up to the jackals of Apollo not to Dionysus. And that is fundamentally because for Nietzsche, he just didn't understand his great predecessors, like Sophocles or um, Isocles, or even Homer for that matter. So what this presents a new kind of distinction where he takes on this persona of a logical, uh, methodical thinker, very much in line with Socrates. So we, this new distinction is no longer between Apollo and Dionysus, it is between Socrates and Dionysus, which essentially opens the door for a thing called the Socratic aesthetic. So what does Socratic art look like? And Nietzsche gives us a, um, a kind of paraphrased, screwed around with sentence from Socrates. So in order to be beautiful, everything must be reasonable. And I think that the original is like, in order to be good, everything must be reasonable. Uh, and that <laughs> you know, in addition, Nietzsche believed that Europe uh, Euripides disliked drunken poets. So in order for something to be beautiful for Socrates, at least as what Nietzsche reads into him, uh, it must correspond by a very logical, reasonable formula. And this is because Socrates believed of instinct to be an oppressive idea. Instinct, you know, pleasure to be things that would take one outside of a reason. To take one outside of, you know, one's um, kind of logical faculties in favor of the body, in favor of kind of, you know, um, stupidity, right? So when Socrates is going around asking, you know, all these people doing jobs, you know, why are you doing that job to which they can't give an answer, Nietzsche then with a side, kind of with a, holds himself in high esteem is like, yeah, you, of course you don't know because you've given yourself over too much to instinct, not to reason. To which Nietzsche is like, well, fuck off, man, asshole. But this image of Socrates in this kind of critical, um, reasonable uh, state is only one way that the art form kind of transformed. Nietzsche says as well that it was transformed to match, to kind of mirror the image of Socrates in his last moments. So when Socrates is facing death, he is calm, cool, collected. And this then becomes a characteristic of art at that point, where it becomes calm, cool, collected, not kind of um, exaggerated, fun, playful. And it is at that point that Nietzsche says that art becomes overgrown with philosophical thought. So what you essentially get then is Socrates in dialectics, you know, the reasonable, 
synth- dialectical thing versus Dionysus. And with that, music is cast away, the chorus is cast away, and all that is left is images. All that is left is kind of a pure Apollonian stream. And because tragedy only exists in the smooth interplay of Dionysus and Apollo, then it sun- then it's dies itself, it, it dies. But Nietzsche isn't totally satisfied with this because to some extent he thinks it impossible for Dionysus to be totally exercised, to be totally conjured away. So he says and points out, in the final days of Socrates' life, he took up music to some extent, and it seemed as though he was taking up art in a way that was different from the kind of reasonable stream. So Nietzsche ponders this and he says, maybe, just maybe, there's a way for science, kind of Socratic art, to become art in and of itself. And how this art, this music that Socrates was taking up as something that he didn't understand, could that reveal a zone and Nietzsche says this, this might reveal to us a zone that is inaccessible to the logician, it is inaccessible to the scientist, it is inaccessible to Socrates, and it, it, what it really does is point to a limitation of all those fields of, you know, rationality, of logic, of reason, that, you know, in order to for them to actually understand, must themselves become art. So then we see a kind of rational art, or a kind of reasonable art or art reason or Socratic art or art Socrates or whatever. So we get then, or he gives us then, you know, another distinction to ponder between artistic man and theoretical man, where artistic man being like the, um, Asicles and, and, uh, Sophocles, as opposed to, um, the theoretical man indicative of Socrates, uh, where the artistic man is content with mystery, the unknown, where they erect art to as a kind of homage to the unknown, while theoretical man is always trying to unveil it, always trying to reveal it, always trying to understand it. And that is the difference between the two. But Nietzsche finds it quite funny that the theoretical man even tries that because it's not possible to understand the unknown to a, to a point. There is always going to be a point of resistance that cannot be breached, that cannot be circumvented kind of wall to the unknown. So Nietzsche says that that is what turns theoretical man into art to some extent, a kind of return of the artist in that moment, because it shows, you know, the triumph of art at in that space of the unknown. So, and the term he gives us is that knowledge must kind of take upon itself a kind of tragic knowledge to, to grasp the unknown, to be able to deal with the unknown, to be able to say to itself, there's something I'll never understand very much in the same line as art and arriving at that primal unity, that kind of supreme unknown. So it's on that note that that's about midway through. That's about at the 16th stanza or kind of aphorism as this book is broken up into uh, that I'll stop there. And next time we'll go from here to the end. And the end in my version includes the piece, uh, the Dionysiac uh, worldview or the... um, I believe that's what it's called, the Dionysiac worldview, uh, which I'll take up as well. So that'll be part of the next half. And then I'm going to do a separate video on um, truth and lies in the non-moral sense, which will be my first short one that might just be like 20 minutes or something. Uh, But yeah, I hope you got something out of this. Uh, I enjoy this book. It's, you know, Nietzsche's early stuff here, it's kind of all over the place. He's talking about, you know, Dionysus and art, and then he's off talking about, you know, uh, Euripides, and then he's back talking about Dionysus and art, and you know, back and forth and back and forth. It makes it difficult to present, and I was tried very hard not to, you know, to actually present a kind of coherent uh, narrative, not a repetitive kind of doubling back sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, anyway.